Warning, footage is early video from the 1970s. Due to original recording, deterioration, restoration, digitalization, and compression, some is technically unstable. Very unstable. It's 4-3. Is there a way to make it 4-3? Why don't you come up and sit down here? Thank you. So Dudley Evanson is uh, was from Raindance, which was a sister organization of ours. Um, Video Freaks and Raindance always had a very close relationship, and uh, we were contemporary, totally contemporaneous uh, at that time, and everybody sort of knew everybody. Many of the Raindance people used to come to Maple Tree Farm. And uh, so we always had a fine relationship with all of them. This is uh, Dudley. <laughs> Dudley went on to do uh, Downsville TV, which was a town not that far, actually. But further Maine. away from New York. Yeah, oh, we were further away, away from we New York. We were way out there. Right. Well, we, we got to the point where all of us were living in New York and doing the thing, and then we like, we need nature. And so we look for places to live outside of, of the city. And we moved to, my husband, Dean Evanson, and I lived in Downsville. Those guys moved up to Lanesville, and later we moved to Woodstock. So yeah, yeah had to get out of the city and do it. But we were, Downsville TV was similar to Lanesville TV. We would go around and videotape all the local people. And we had a little, we pull up to a tele, ours was less organized than theirs. We pull up to a, a telephone pole. And we plugged in our, our video. There was an AC current and a, a connection to the, uh, the cable. So cable was new at the time. So we plugged in our, well, what was it? A, so, uh, it was the playback unit. Yeah. And we play yeah. our tapes that we'd made the week before, interviewing the, at the local police chief, or the square dance, or the school, or the quarry, or the farmers, or whoever we were videotaping. And that was what was so cool about being out there in the country, because we would you know, get to know the people. It was all about making people important. Because before we had ABC, NBC, and CBS, and there was one sort of VHS station. But there was no real people's TV, and this was our opportunity to say, hey, everyone is important. And so we'd play it, and they'd watch it, and we had our little show every week, just like Lanesville. Yeah. It's cool. So as an activist tool, you know, it was uh, something that we used to get to know the community, mirrored them back, and then we could, you know, uh, give them our propaganda after they <laughs> trusted us by trusting them. Did, did you have a transmitter and you actually broadcast? Yes. We had a Gerald Cable Driver. That Abby and, Hoffman gave us. Yeah, Abby Hoffman. Well, he gave us the money to buy the Gerald Cable Driver. Yeah, $80. I think it was. And uh, we yeah. bought a Gerald Cable Driver, which is a transmitter, actually. And uh, so it was we, a modulator and yeah. an amplifier, and then Perry yeah. and Chuck wrote the section and steal this book about how to broadcast your own TV shows. Yeah. Abby wanted us to get arrested. We said, Abby, you like to get arrested, <laughs> we like to make TV shows. <laughs> so we're going to keep making this. TV shows, we moved it. We were transmitting, the first experiments were in the city, and then we moved to the country and then started this station, and then in the beginning we were on several times a week, but it got too demanding, and then we were on like a Friday night yeah. screenings and Buckaroo Bar Friday show was Saturday. Saturday night. Saturday night. I think Friday. Oh, one of the nights was yeah. uh, the evening show, which where we just played tapes like these, and then uh, Saturday morning Bart had a the Buckaroo Bar show mm -hmm. with people, kids from the community and stuff, and would tell a story. The Sheik that shook Lanesville was about a guy coming to Lanesville from. Uh, the Mideast to uh, buy the land because it was uh, uh, oil rich and you right. know and then Buck Rubart had to like save the community blah blah. Understand um, that this was 40 years ago uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know but it's amazing how conditions haven't changed so much 
But in any case, uh, that was a long time ago. Some of you, most of you, were not here uh, when all of this was going on, which is which I find interesting. Uh, almost everybody is younger than we are now. <laughs> okay. This guy, oh, a few questions. Yeah. This fellow in the back. So, so, sorry if, uh, if you touch upon this, because I think we're a little bit late. Um, I come from a country where we had two and a half national channels um, when I was about 18. And I, I'm very envious of watching this kind of it's a fake nostalgia on my part for imagining the possibility of seeing this, encountering this material back when it was made and just how exciting and agitating it would have been. It would have like, blown my mind. And thinking about how relatively, even in an American context, monolithic and centralized and privatized and economized uh, the, the moving image and news was in those eras, uh, in that era. Now, of course, you, you find two-year-old children who, who go up to a TV and do this because they're used to iPads. That, that they, they, they press a, an app and they watch thermal images of themselves. They do split screens. And the, the visual culture move, uh, um, moving image has changed so massively. Stuff you can just watch, uh, document, upload has pluralized massively. So what, when you see this stuff and you, and you think about your relationship to some notional idea of the mainstream and you think about it right now, what, what is going on in your heads? Well, so true that. I mean, we provided some of that context at the beginning about the uh, uh, limited corporate control of media, but the point is, you're right, 60,000 videos a day get posted on YouTube. Uh, so now it's a different uh, issue. Uh, in those days, it was getting access, getting on. But once you got on, everybody saw it. Now you can get on easily, but who knows about it? You have to figure out how to publicize it and make it go viral. So the Michael Motion video has a million hits, or nearly, you know, I'm very pleased about that. But then the question becomes in the 21st century, how do you monetize that when there's like no more copyright? And so for organizing, that's a different issue. For having a career in it, you know, I still haven't figured it out. You know. Uh, at these meetings that uh, Skip and I and other, others of the video freaks and rain dance people go to, um, I've been asked a lot of times, like, what, you know, what, what goes on in my mind when I see all of this at, a, at this later time? And uh, what, what do I feel about that experience then? And I used to think that uh, one of the things I thought that was very important was that what we had done and what all of the uh, video people working with us at the same time had done was recorded a very faithful picture of a particular time, a particular history, and a particular group of people, thousands and thousands of them, who you know, were involved in activism back in those days. As I get older, though, you know, I think about it again, and I think, well, that was important. It was important that we did that. That was good. But what was the most important thing, I think, about us and Raindance and all the other small video groups that were working at that time, because we were not the only ones, you know, was their example, the example that they set. This is what we did. Now, you go do something. <laughs> well, so um, in 1972, my husband and I went to the United Nations, the very first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, and we videotaped it. And what, freaked, what flipped us out was that uh, there were 15 Native Americans who had been sent over by Stuart Brand to the Whole Earth Catalog. They're talking about Mother Earth. They're talking about nature. They're talking about the planet. And it was so different from any of the other uh, presentations at the United Nations. So we videotaped that. And then 20 years after that, we went to Rio and videotaped that with higher, you know, we had color. Oh, wow. The our first ones were in half inch black and white video. So, and then a year after that, we were called out to Wounded Knee. And this was partly because 
Dean knew how to transmit uh, television, and they'd invited him out to Wounded Knee in South Dakota when the occupation happened. So they said, okay, we need you to come out and transmit video, because this was a big deal for the Native people. And they got out there, and a couple of days after the lawyer said, don't go in, because they're going to come out soon. So they stuck around for a month and videotaped all these elders and the wise men and the ma uh, medicine people and learned so much. And so those videos became part of a, a video we made called Great Mystery. And then it just set us on our path of trying to understand how the earth, you know, what is it about the earth? What is it about humans and the planet? Because, you know, in the early days it was like litter. That was the first thing you noticed. And then it was like, okay, so how are we gonna figure this out? And we're still dealing with the same issues. This hasn't, we haven't solved the problems. So we hope that the young people of today will be reaching out and, and getting their, you know, uh, cameras going and going and videotaping things that will instigate, instigate social change to make a better world because this is something we can use it. We can use media, we can use the audio, the video, anything to help to educate people. So YouTube is a blessing. Thank you very much. Now our videos can go out. It used to be we didn't have VCRs, we didn't have video cassettes. There was cable hadn't even started. And Dean actually was first, he was right there when they first set up the uh, Sterling Manhattan cable when we first set up public access TV. So we lobbied for public access TV. Now public access, I think, became a little weird and kind of got a little extreme. It was Hopefully. cool for a while, but uh, you know, eh. but at least it got something going where human beings, little everyday people like ourselves, could go out and make a video of something that was relevant. So that's what it's all about to us, and that's why we were such activists in those days, that we wanted to use it was like putting the tools of media in the hands of the people. What can you do? So that's what we're hoping that everyone will continue to do as time goes on. Well, you mentioned public access. I was actually going to ask about George Stoney passed last year. So do you, have some, do you have some words about him? For, I mean, Pete Seeger didn't pass this year. So do you have some words? And, and, uh, well, we're next, I guess. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's our turn. You know, I mean, didn't he live in 90s? Wasn't he yeah. in his 90s? Yeah. I mean, he took the fight all the way to Congress to get public access. So yeah. that's kind of like, it, it, it is kind of the, the way that he saw the initial, I mean, if you look at YouTube's terms of service, right? You, you don't get paid, you just post. No, you that's, do get paid. Uh, I mean, let me tell you, you get paid. If you get enough hits, absolutely. you'll get monetized. So yeah. get your hits, make something that's really special and really important. You will get monetized and you'll get money. And we do as musicians, and that's what we do now. Okay, but it's, 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 it's like a, it's a, it's a game for popularity. So, right. so, so that was kind of encoded into the, the public access that, that it was kind of this, this utility, uh, seeing like uh, broadcast as a utility. Do you, do you see still kind of this, I mean, because that's what's being figured out right now, right? Is, it, is how do you get bankers paid in, in terms of how, how do you support these kind of projects? Well, George Stoney was a big believer in public access, even though it is less relevant now than it was then. In other words, then it was the only means of communication that people had freely. Now you can post. So it's, you know, it's a rainbow, it's a, it's a whole variety of means of, uh, you know, getting your work out there, right? It's a whole variety. At a certain point, I had to give up myself on public access because I found that I couldn't count on an audience. So I, you know, my work became more uh, public television oriented. And I still like television, but the point is it's only part of the picture and will soon be obsolete, will soon be obsolete, and will soon be wearing like glasses and tuning in our channels uh, here. And uh, you know, uh, again, it becomes a question of um, 
spin and getting your the word out to watch it. So that's why 2015 is the year of the video freaks and our documentary and our museum show are coming out that year and hopefully we'll be able to get this material out into the public. So it's about video freaks, it's about the style of doing it, which I find when we're showing this 70s stuff, audiences relate to because of some, not everybody, but some really relate to because of the freshness of the message, right? Of the long takes and the integrity of the bad camera work that make you believe that this is like saying something. And then, so it's about the style of it, and then it's about the subject matter. Uh, content. About saving, content. you know, about, you know, civil rights What's and the uh, saving the planet and all the things that we think are important. So, like, that's why, you know, we're going to continue to, as the video freaks, be active in getting the message out there because we care about it. And in our little time on the planet, we would like to make an impact. It's not about a popularity contest. It's about making an impact on the world. And hopefully, I mean, this is so fucking corny, but making the world a better place, uh, not despite corny. Not corny. all the odds. <laughs> despite all the odds that my friend Esty was saying to me today, she is hopeless. Like, it's the Koch mm -hmm. brothers, and you know, and I'm saying you gotta get out into the light. Stay in the light. That's all you can do. So there you go. Good. What were you going to say? What I was going to say was I think George Stoney came to us from Canada. And he came to us out of a very interesting and rich media environment. Uh, I just wanted to put that in because uh, the that Canadian. Was supported. Yeah, that was well that supported. Was government. That was well supported. And, uh, you know, the Canadian media environment was quite far ahead of ours, actually, in many, many ways. Challenge for change. Yeah, challenge for change, of course. And uh, I just wanted to put that in there. Let me tell you a funny story about George Stoney. Canadians here. So, so my niece was uh, taking a film course at NYU, and she's what she's George Sony is her professor, and of course he was a dear friend of ours during the video early video years. So she's watching this video, and all of a sudden she looks and she sees a picture of me giving birth to my <laughs> second child. She says, "I'm my cousin," <laughs> and it was so cool that, you know, it keeps going. And that's what we love. It's all about planting seeds. It's about inspiring people. Um, you don't have to have shaky camera work. That's not necessary to make it a good video or interesting. You can have your tripods and you can get your sound, get it, you know, we want to get the high tech. I think it's important to have good quality. So you want to be pointing your camera at things that are relevant and then posting them on YouTube, posting them wherever you can. But YouTube seems to be one of the good places where people can see. Then you gotta let people know about it. It's all about distributing it, like getting it out there, and then if your quality is good enough, you will get played on places that actually do get some good distribution. So that's, that's a goal. It's a good thing to share what you care about. Share what you care about. Donaldo had one more question, and then we're sort of wrapped I don't up there. Have, I don't actually have a question, but I, I do have a thought. And oh, the wait for the cameras. Thoughts are good. We like thoughts. Oh, okay. oh yeah, tell us your thoughts. It's um, again, it's it's to the young people who by now really I think understand that this is really a revolutionary time that's being depicted here. Um, everybody now can reach into their pocket and make a video, they can edit it, they can distribute it to the world in real time. It's, so to think back to a time when suddenly this tool just sprung into existence that you could actually walk down the street and be shooting video was revolutionary. Now, I thought it was interesting that the very first shot you have in the film was not activism, it was playing with the machine, you know, and seeing what it could do. And people, everybody who got access to this was trying some things. And some people were interested in narrative, some people were interested in art, 
Some people were interested in documentary. Some people were activists. And that's the direction you took, and so brilliantly and importantly. And what I found most remarkable about this piece is how much it really captured the feeling of the time. You know, I, you know, it was my time, I was there, and this shows it. But didn't you forget it a little bit? And it's kind of fun to be reminded. That's yeah, what I thought. Know, I loved it. Like, there was a lot going on, and there was a lot of courage that happened that pushed the envelope. So. Thank you for that comment. In terms of passing it on, the fact that Sadie is here is like really important for us, just for a family uh, reason. But uh, uh, the point is that I've been teaching video, and I, what I've realized is that we might have been the first to do it for the first time. But now everybody picks up a camera for the first time, iPhone, too. Baby. And so everybody has that feeling of capturing something and the satisfaction and learning the skills to do it. So um, just the way I've realized that every park, well, this is a different issue, but every park is everybody's park. Uh, everybody's camera for them is their first time. So they can have that feeling of discovery. But we were lucky because there were no teachers, there was no history, there was nothing. It was a blank canvas, and it was really, you know, ex incredibly exciting. Like, um, in terms of uh, Dara saying uh, ecstatic experience, uh, you, know, you know, I hope that we could share some of the ecstatic experience with you all tonight that we had during those years, because it was like, I mean, there was a lot of uh, desperation and torture uh, uh, being, you know, uh, out on a limb uh, in certain ways. Uh, but that's the other side of the ecstasy that uh, kept us doing it, I think, right? It's good, yes. As one of the story young people um, uh, that has been talked about, I just wanted to uh, say, um, like, yes, but that e ecstasy, the ecstatic, um, did come through um, in the images. Um, and I had this thought watching it, and you've articulated this also, that things have not changed all that much. And I can confirm that things have not changed all that much. Watching the protest footage was very, very difficult because I've watched that protest footage on a live stream. Um, OWS. I've, yeah, OWS. I was, I was, I, it's, my, the phone is gone now, but I was on, I was one of the hundreds and of people like with their phones out like because there's what else are you going to do when there's a line of police like pushing you back from whoever's getting beat on uh on wall street and so that stuff still happens only now it's phones um and it's uh, i can i wish there were more um of the of the live streaming team here tonight because we should know this history um, and because it's repeating itself, um, or at least it has. Hopefully it won't continue to. Um, no, it has to keep continuing because the greedy bullies will always be out there and there'll always have to be a popular movement to preserve po people's rights, you know. So it, a peace is not like an end result, it's a process, you know, that you're always going towards and sort of never achieve. Um, Try or maybe achieve on a personal level, what? Yeah, try walking. Try walking to oh, oh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because walking. Oh, yeah. Um, some question. Oh, and um, sorry to, and just the one more thing. I don't know if there's an answer to this question because I don't know the issue well enough on my own. But in terms of access and how the challenge that you faced was access and bringing um, the technology to the people and bringing people to the technology and allowing them to express themselves. I think the uh, parallel now might be um, net neutrality um, and the, uh, the issue um, that is being fought against um, and for um, in terms of limiting access to internet based on pay scales um, and how like since the internet has become this po the populist 
method of disseminating information, um, how that could that could be the new like I don't know CBS CBS ABC yeah. NBC like that like since those were the monopolies on information back in the day um, that could that could happen There's cameras as we come into this building, and they, they've obviously been the number has been amplified since 9/11 for mm -hmm. you know and and before that for many reasons. It seems that for a lot of people I know, whether they're activists or musicians or performers, the new front the front line of uh, it's not necessarily about uh, multiplication and pluralization, but it's about actually holding on to the idea of uh, strategic invisibility. The idea of, uh, that you're being monitored by satellites, by Google, by the NSA, by even the, the act of inquiry, that you're by constantly the, being logged. Yes, yeah, and you're being logged <laughs> and documented all the time. So many artists I know, you know, make sure that there's no cameras because they actually feel there's some dilution of the intensity of that artistic or that political or that ontological moment. The fact that somebody can watch it to distribute that image, and they re they regard that as some kind of weakening or dilution of those extra social social bonds that are present here now by us being in this room, rather than you know through through the lens. And so I, I suppose I love everything I've seen, but I want to speak up for the idea of not being documented, yeah. and of the camera not being there, and that as being an equally important political strategy. Well, hopefully there's no camera in your bathroom. And you had something to add? Yeah, just uh, comments, uh, the somewhat anti-climax. And I think there's, uh, you know, just uh, uh, talking about history, I was a uh, 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 Tenement protest uh, student leader. I was the first exile. And I'm one of the, uh, uh, I participated in Occupy from beginning to the end, including Chicago and any of those. The reason I mentioned those uh, is that this is very personal to me. But historically, this is uh, possibly the most hopeful time. You look at the regime change in the last three decades. Throughout modern history, we never had a time like this where dozens of regime change happened. And it happened very quickly. It happened peacefully. It happened bottom up. I just want to lay there that, you know, as frustrated as we are, uh, if you care about the poor, the labor, and the underprivileged, you care about the egg versus the stone, the rock, right? This is the best time for eggs. I mean, it's, it's not easy. Never is. It shouldn't be easy, but you know, there's a lot more reason to be hopeful now. And I want to, I want to add to that hopeful. because yes. because we, we know. Hope. I remember in the '60s having this conversation with someone. Saying, well, we we know what we're against. What are we for? And so I think it's really important to uh, demonstrate and show and document what is it we're for. We need to show what the model is. Because a lot of people can't figure it out. What does it look like? How can we uh, lift up the visible image of the life that we want to create on this planet where we are in harmony with nature, we are in harmony with other human beings, we are in harmony with planets and plant planets and plants and other nations and and people we don't agree with. So let's show what that looks like. That's what I want to see. I want to see what it looks like. Thank you.